Dear God, here we are. What can we say? Well, Martin said it in Portuguese. We say it in English. Obrigado. Thank you for sending a Savior who knew where we were, no matter how cold the night. He kept searching. He keeps seeking until we connect. Don't give up on us, Father. Don't give up on our friends. Don't give up on our children. Don't give up on our neighbors. Don't give up on our nation. Don't give up on us. That's why Jesus came, for which we are very, very thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Because this is the next to the last day of this year, would it be all right if we begin with a question? I hope so. So here's the question. Think carefully. How many times have you sinned this year? No, I'm serious. You say, Dwight, it's none of your business. I know that, but I'm curious. <laughs> How many times have you sinned this year? Pull your little uh, calculator out. Come on, you can figure it out. Just run the numbers. If you sin once a day, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But if you sin once a day, how many times would you have sinned in a year? 365. If you had sinned two times a day, how many, how many, how many uh, times would you have uh, sinned in a year? 730. If you had sinned three times, wow, three times a day? Yeah, three times a day. 1,095. But that's really not the number I want. You know the number I want? I want to know what the number would be for if we tallied everybody's sins for this past year. What would the number be? And let's throw in all the live streamers who are here, extra, sitting in pajamas. Should have had your suit and tie on, but there you are in pajamas. <laughs> I should have known. But anyway, we throw them all in. Look, if you had 1,000 people that we threw in, we're talking about 1,095,000 sins just for this little group. That's a big number, which makes what you're about to read so stunning in its offer. I want you to open your Bible with me on this last Sabbath of this year. Open your Bible to Colossians, the little book of Colossians. Haven't been there in a long time, have you? Yeah, me neither. Colossians chapter 2. I'll be in the New International Version. You grab a pew Bible if you'd like or track it along with that device of yours. Colossians chapter 2, you've got to read these words. Uh, this is Colossians 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, in other words, when you were pagan, just a pagan rebel, mm -hmm. God made you alive with Christ. He's just been talking about baptism and resurrection. He made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having, verse 15, disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, that sounds just like a little bit of a theological, spiritual jargon. I mean, what is he saying? So I pull out my little pocket uh, message translation. Let me read it to you in the message. This will be Eugene Peterson's rendition. Same verses. Put them on the screen for you so you can follow it along. This, this feels friendly. Let's read it together. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, pagan rebel that you were, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Mm. Think of it. Now, here it goes. All sins forgiven. The slate wiped clean. That old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross, and he marched them naked through the streets. Wow. All those demonic powers that actually led us into sin. Was it 1,095 we settled on three a day? That many times. And by the way, they've been defeated 2,000 years ago. We've been defeated by a defeated foe. He knows he's lost. He's just trying to take as many with him as he can. Wow, think of it. What did we just read? Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. Talking about good news, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't get any better than this. 
It doesn't get any better. Reminds me of uh, Jerry Bridges in his, in his wonderful book, Transforming Grace, Living Confidently in God's Unfailing Love. Look what he's written. Put it on the screen, please. Jesus paid the debt of all our sins, past, present, and future. As Paul said in Colossians 2.13, which we just read, God forgave us all our sins. He go, Bridges goes on. We don't have to start all over again and try to keep the slate clean. There is no more slate. As Stephen Brown wrote, God took our slate and he broke it in pieces and threw it away. Isn't that good? The old King NIV renders it, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. But I like those words, all sins forgiven. All of them. Wait a minute, isn't that what Jesus prayed on the cross for us? You ever see Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ? It's been a few years now. You seen it? There's that one scene. You remember, they've got Jesus prone on the, uh, atop the cross on the ground, cross beam right behind him. Camera moves in on one of his hands. They roughly jerk his hand out, extend it far, and then hands reach in from out of the picture. We only see the burly Roman guard's hands as he reaches in and he puts a Roman nail and holds it with one hand and with the other mallet he begins to pound as we watch through the flesh of Christ Jesus. We never see the face of the one driving that nail. But the director, Mel Gibson, would later testify that he asked for that part, his only moment in his own movie, when he holds the nail and he drives it into the flesh of his Savior. Boy, makes a powerful point, doesn't it? We were all there. We were all there when Jesus prayed. The day they executed him. You remember the seven last words of Christ on the cross? The number one, put them on the screen. You know them well. Jesus said, Father. Let's, let's read it out loud together. Father. Yeah, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. You're kidding me. You don't think they know what they're doing? You don't think you, 1,095 times this year, we didn't know what we were doing? Give me a break. We know what we're doing. They knew what they were doing. And yet, get this, desire of ages. Ah, provocative. On the screen again. That prayer of Christ for his enemies embraced the world. It took in every sinner that had lived or should live from the beginning of the world to the end of time. Babies yet to be born. Our next granddaughter's coming in February. Her sins have already been covered. Upon all rests the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. To all, forgiveness is freely offered. Whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. End quote. That prayer was for you. That prayer was for me. That prayer was for 1,095 times this year that you and I have sinned. Surely the number is too low. That prayer was for every sin we have sinned. Or yet shall sin. What did we just read from, from Colossians chapter 2, 13? Put it on the screen again. All sins forgiven. That's the gospel. And by the way, not just forgiven, mm -mm, but apparently forgotten as well. May I run these by you just as fast as I can? I'll give you just enough time to scribble these verses down because there's no study guide and you'll wish you had all four of these. Let me just run these by you. Four provocative promises of divine amnesia. In chronological order, here they come. Write them down. Number one, Isaiah 43, 25, God speaking, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. No more. Here comes number two, Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Here comes Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Sounds just like Jeremiah. It is. Here's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Then God adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. There they are, ladies and gentlemen, four provocative promises of merciful and gracious divine amnesia. I will remember your sins no more. All sins forgiven is apparently met by all sins forgotten. Isn't that something? 
I mean, am I pulling something over on you here? Did we tweak the verses, make them read what they don't say? Yeah, but come on, Dwight. Doesn't God keep a record of sin somewhere? You're right. He does. Just in case, just in case, you decide when this whole thing is over, you'd rather be your own Savior, and you no longer need Jesus to save you. If you change your mind, buyer's remorse, I'm not taking it. You change your mind, then you can have all 1,095 sins for this year and however many sins it takes till you were born backwards. You may have them all, but who would be that stupid to take them all? I will remember your sins no more. But it gets even better because to match these four provocative divine amnesia promises come these four provocative divine amnesia actions. These will be even faster. Jot them down. Here they come. Four divine actions. Isaiah 38, 17. You, God, have put all my sins behind your back. And when something goes behind your back, it is no longer in your consciousness. It's gone. Here comes number two. Isaiah 44, 22, God speaking, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Just like, you know, when the sun shines over the St. Joseph Valley and you got that low-hanging cloud and mist and then it just burns it up. Gone. Where'd it go? It's gone. Here's number three, Micah 7, 19, you will again have compassion on us, O God. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. We were sailing around the world from Japan, missionary kids and missionary parents. And one early morning, the ship stopped, no sound of engine. And my dad tapped me and said, let Mom and Greg and Gary sleep. You follow me. Up to the top deck. Dad said, look down there. There was the captain of the ship in his immaculate naval whites, first officer in his whites, a little family. And on a platform leaning out over the sea, a flag-draped coffin. A few words were exchanged, a prayer was made, and that platform just went like this. I, this is a kid, just watch it. Platform went like this. Shh, burial at sea. God says, That's what I've done to your sins. I buried them in the bottom of the sea. One more, New Testament, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God, Peter preaching, so that your sins may be wiped out, blotted out, as some translations render it, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that the Messiah may return. That's the next line. Four divine amnesia actions to match four divine amnesia promises. I will remember your sins no more. What's that mean? All sins forgiven and all sins forgotten. That's it. But before I sit down, I must dutifully remind you and me that what God does for us, we must do for others, including ourselves. The hardest person in the world to forgive is right here. The same Paul who wrote Colossians 2 in prison also wrote Philippians 3 in prison. And everybody knows these words. Put them on the screen, please. But this one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting what is where, what's behind me. I'm turning my back on it. Forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead. What does he say? I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is speaking of himself. He has a sad and tragic record. But I forget, I choose to forget what is behind me. The gift of a good forgetter. It's not only God's gift for us. It's our gift for others. It's our gift for ourselves. Forget it. Leave those sins where you buried them. Leave her sins there. Leave his sin. Don't, 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 don't touch those. Because if I don't forget you, if I don't forgive you, well, I tell you, I know what he did, and I'm not going to forgive him for that. I know what she did. I know what she said. I know the action they took. I'm not going to forgive him. As long as I live, I'm not going to forgive him. Ooh. Who sins worse, me against God or you against me? Now, what you've done to me is not right, but what I've done to God 1,095 times just this year. It's wrong. It's a sin. I know how God has treated me in spite of the way I've treated him. 
Sometimes, you know, it's, it's just important to remind ourselves that when Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, he chose to comment of the entire prayer of seven petitions, he chooses to comment on only one of them in the Sermon on the Mount. And here's the one he comments on. Put it on the screen, please. You know the words very well. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But the, it, that's wrong. The English has it wrong. In the Greek, it reads this way. Forgive us our debts as we forgave already forgave our debtors. Eris, past completed action before now. So God says, hey Dwight, you want me to forgive you? I sure do. Good. I'll do it. I, I'm going to forgive you like you didn't forgive him. No, no, no. Jesus says, you don't forgive your friend, you don't get forgiven. Why? Because you're hanging on to it. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We pray it. That forgiveness is the way of God. Forgiveness is the way of this book. Anywhere in this book you turn, it's forgiveness. Forgiveness, it, it, you go to the Bible's who's who collection. And what's happening with them? You have Joseph throwing wide his arms and forgiving his stepbrothers of treachery they have done decades ago. Forgive it. It's the way the book operates. With Jesus forgiving Mary Magdalene, even as Mary forgave Uncle Simon, who sexually abused her when she was young and led her into sin. There had to be reciprocal forgiveness for Mary to be set free. It's the way the book operates. With the prodigal father racing off the porch, throwing his arms around the now-come-home prodigal son. That's just the way it, hap it operates in the kingdom of God. With Jesus forgiving Peter of his heinous public denial while Peter spends the rest of his life struggling to forgive himself. The Apostle Paul forgiving runaway young disciple Mark and in the end inviting him back into his missionary circle. Bring my son Mark to me. He writes from prison. Forgiveness. For Jesus forgiving you and me with the words, Father, forgive them. They didn't know. They don't know what they're doing. With mercy, putting the best face he can on it. Please forgive them. Forgetting those things which are behind is not God just God and with you and your past, but it's me with you and your past. It's me with me and my past. The gift of a good forgetter. But, God, but does God really treat us that way? I want to end with two stories. One of the stories from the Bible, the other not quite. The one from the Bible, remember King David? A terrible moral meltdown with Bathsheba. By the time David is through, he's broken every commandment. Every one of the Ten Commandments, all of them. Adultery, coveting first, adultery, lying, killing, psh, all of them. Honor your father and mother, gone. Broke them all. David dies, as all good people do. After he's dead, God's talking to another king. He says, I want to, talk to, I want to tell you about my, son, my, my, my friend David. You're not going to believe this, but I want you to see it. 1 Kings chapter 14, jot this verse. If there's nothing else you jot down, jot this verse down. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 8. It's just one verse. I'll put it on the screen for you. Let's do it together. But, God says to this evil king, you have not been like my servant David who is now dead. You have not been like my servant David who, number one, I put the numbers in, who, number one, kept my commandments. Whoa, stop. Time out. God, kept your commandments? Broke every single one of them by the time he was through. What do you mean? Amnesia. Is that your problem? Can't remember, huh? You do better. Keep reading. But you have not been like my servant David, who, number one, kept my commandments, and number two, follow me with all his heart. Time out. Followed you with all his heart? You got to be kidding me. He gave it. How many women did he give his heart to? What's going on here? Let's read that again. But you have not been like my servant David, who, number one, kept my commandments, and number two, followed me with all his heart, and number three, did only what was right in my eyes. Come on. Whoa. It's not amnesia. It's Alzheimer's. <laughs> only what is right in my eyes, David did. God, have mercy. And that's exactly what he's doing. Having mercy. You see, apparently, 
when I confess and I ask for forgiveness and I turn away from that sin, God treats me as if he never did it. Look at David. He never did it. He never did it. No wonder Steps of Christ, page 62. Jot that not down for you. For your reference, Steps of Christ, that classic, page 62 on the screen. If you give yourself to Jesus and accept him as your Savior, then sinful as your life may have been for his sake, you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. Just as if you had not sinned. Ladies and gentlemen, it's called the gospel. And the gospel means very good news. Let's pray. Oh, God. Wow. <laughs> you said it. We read it. You must mean it. We want to believe it. Please, dear Father, just a few hours left, but there's some stuff we need to settle, you and me. We're going to take you at your word. I can't live with this guilt. I can't live with this mess. We need to be set free. And only a God who can forget is a God we can cast ourselves upon right now. So thank you. Please, don't let us forget that the news really is this good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Think of the last time someone said, I'm praying for you. Didn't it give you a sense of peace and reassurance that somebody cares for me? I know how I feel when I get an email from one of our viewers saying, Yo, Dwight, I've been praying for you lately. There's nothing like knowing someone is praying for you. So I want to offer you an opportunity to partner. Let me, let us partner with you in prayer. If you have a special prayer request or a praise of thanksgiving you'd like to share with us, I'm inviting you to contact one of our friendly chaplains. Simple to do. You can call our toll-free number, 877, the two words, His Will, 877-HIS-WILL. That friendly voice that answers, you tell him, you tell her what your prayer need is. We'll join with you in that petition. And may the God who answers prayer journey with you these next few days until we're right back here together again next time.